Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, today is the day of our uh, sixth lecture uh, of our international lecture series on historical development of anthropology as a discipline in Asia. Now, people are joining throughout the world, specifically from the Asian countries. I welcome you all. And I would like to share today's platform to Dr. Tharaka Ananda, today's moderator. And now, uh, Dr. Tharaka, you can proceed. Thank you very much, sir. A very good evening to all of you, dear Professor Dalma Garden Rodder. Uh, and organizing committee members from the three departments of the anthropology, the uh, MDM, the NGC, and USJ, my dear colleagues and participants. Today, we gathered here to our sixth lecture under the International Lecture Series on Historical Development of Anthropology as a Discipline in Asia. Today, our specially invited speaker, Professor Dolma Gordon Roder, will take, will talk on the historical development of anthropology as a discipline in Bhutan. First, before that, before going to that special event, I would like to invite Dr. Radna Tayeng, Head Department of Anthropology, DNGC, to deliver the welcome address. Uh, very good afternoon to all. Thank you, Taraka Ananda, ma'am. I am Dr. Ratna Tayeng. On behalf of the Department of Anthropology, Deranath and Government College, Itanagar, Arunachal Pradesh, India, Brinali Datta Mahavidya uh, Pirati, West Bengal, and the That's University of Sri Jawadana Fura, Sri Lanka, extend a very warm welcome to this uh, international lecture series on the historical development of anthropology as a discipline in Asia. It's a great pleasure to welcome our today's speaker, Dr. Dolma Choden Roder, Associate Professor, Anthropology Program, Department of Social Science, Royal Timbu College, Bhutan. Thanks and thanks for accepting our request. I also welcome all the persons, audience from different corners of India and abroad uh, for joining us today. The main motto behind organizing this lecture is to bring anthropologists from Asia to disseminate, cultivate, and engage anthropological knowledge under a single umbrella. Thank you all for joining us today. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, now, without much uh, delay, we can move to the special event of the day, the special lecture. Before that, let me introduce Professor Dolma uh, Jordan Roder. Uh, Professor Dolma is Associate Professor, Anthropology Program, Royal Timpu College, and Program Leader, Anthropology Program, Royal Timpu College, Bhutan. Uh, she has obtained her Bachelor's of Art degree from the University of Melbourne, Australia, an honors degree in anthropology from the same, same university, and main sociology in cultural anthropology from the Arizona State University. And she has obtained her PhD in social cultural anthropology from the School of Human Evolution and Social State Change, Arizona State University. Her dissertation title was Girls Should Come Up education and gender in contemporary Bhutan. She has done various publications in peer-reviewed, we can categorize them into peer-reviewed publications, other publication and reports and reviews and many of the things. And among them, um, there was an academic writing, which I um, guess as an edited book, which she and uh, two other uh, authors has written on folded into a paperboard, a collection of Bhutan is poems in English, Ryan books, Timpu Bhutan, and she has conducted many of researches on um, uh, Meno in central Bhutan and the change and continuity in uh, Bhumtang, and also too good to teach Bhutanese students and the hierarchy of aspirations. And uh, some are on who, who are, that's too personal the reported behavior knowledge and success of reproductive health education and which is published in a uh, uh, journal of royal Timpu college so these type of things has been published by her and also she has received scholarships 
and fellowships. In 2008, she has received Excellence in Active Student Centered Teaching Award for the academic year 2017 and 2017 18 from the Royal Team College. And 2007, she has obtained uh, Philip Mason Thompson Award for the Outstanding Socio Cultural Graduate Student, the School of Human Evolution and Social Change from the Arizona State University. And she has received various type of fellowships and scholarships from the Council of Anthropology and Education and Dean Soward Scholarship, University Graduate Scholarship from the Arizona State University. Uh, she has done various kinds of things in regarding the development of anthropology. Now we can move to um, our uh, special lecture. Uh, please, um, uh, Madam, this is uh, the platform is over to you. Okay, I'm going to try and put my presentation up. Um, let's see. Uh, I will do a window. Wait, no. Select window screen. Wait, let me. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, never mind. No, let's go back. How do I do this? Uh, Okay. Um, now, is my PowerPoint visible? Yes, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just start it from the beginning. Um, so I, I'll start. Um, it, it's probably quite a short um, lecture. I was telling my mother that I was going to give this talk today and she said it's going to be a very short talk because the history of anthropology in Bhutan is, is quite short also. Um, so uh, I, I don't know how much uh, people know about Bhutan. We're such a small country compared with our neighbors. So I thought I'd say a little bit about the country, uh, particularly those aspects of it that have a impact on the way in which anthropology has Madam, developed Madam, in the country. Yes, Madam, yes, yes. There is no presentation, no? So it Pardon? shows already they are presenting, but uh, mm -hmm. there is no PPT slides and anything else. Pardon, I'm sorry, what did you see, sir? Actually, yes, uh, you can you can now share your PPT. PPT is not now. showing. Okay. 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 Just click on try. the present now. Okay. At first, you should open the your PPT. Okay, it's open. My PPT is open. Okay. Okay. Now go back. Then click, then click onto the share present. Present now. Um, Share your entire screen. Share okay. your entire screen. Sorry, one second. I don't know. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, let me go again. So it's coming. Um, it's coming. Okay. Now you oh nice going. Is it now is it working? No. Not working. Sorry. Okay, no uh, problem. So I do present your entire screen. Do I have to open my PPT first, then yes, present yes, your yes. entire screen? Okay. Yes. And then yes. um let this come. Okay. Now okay, now is it there? Take yes, it's coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, it's yes, visible yes. now. Now, now you show your slide at one point. Yeah, is is it show? Is the map of Bhutan showing? Is that yes, what's yes. on the screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So I'll just control. Continue. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank so you you can kind of see that Bhutan is at the edge of the eastern Himalayas. Um, so we're mostly mountainous. We have a very small population. Less than a million. Um, and I think that has an impact on the way things have developed too. We're predominantly Vajrayana or Tibetan Buddhist. Um, though, of course, we, we have uh, other uh, religious faiths represented. Um, the other interesting thing about us is that we were a theocracy until 1907. And that has a, a, quite a large impact on the our academic tradition. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that too. Um, and then 1907, we became a monarchy. And in 2007, we became a constitutional monarchy when our first democratic government was elected. Um, two other things that are, are sort of maybe um, important to know about Bhutan is that we were, we're quite um, 
uh, quite often we're described as quite isolated. And so uh, people talk about things like television and internet arriving only in 1999. However, I think as, as anthropologists, we all recognize that uh, places are quite connected. Um, there, even when, when travel is not easy, people, are, people and ideas are still moving around. So um, I think you have to take that with a grain of salt. The other thing that we're quite well known about, uh, for is that we are uh, the home of gross national happiness, which is sort of a, a, an alternative way in which to measure development. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more if you're interested later, but um, it's not so pertinent to, to this talk. So I'm going to move so to the next you please have full screen? Would you please put it in full screen? I think, I mean, it's looking like full screen on my screen, so I'm not sure how it looks on your screen. Uh, is there something I should be doing to make it full screen? Uh, oh, what did I just do? Is it still showing? Um, you can, you can. Uh, now is it full from screen? The, from the beginning. Uh, you can put just in the, uh, what I can say, in the left upper corner, there's a left chart. Upper corner. Uh, no, I don't think it's working. Uh, left upper corner. Oh, okay. Is yes, it okay? From the beginning. Yes. Okay, I go from the beginning and then. Yeah. Yes. Now is it showing? No problem. Yeah. No, just click in the, just click in the go from the beginning. Sorry, I, I'm not. I, I'm, I can't. I can't hear you properly. What were you saying? Or you can, you can click on the. You can click on the. From beginning, beginning, from beginning. From beginning. To okay. The, I've got yeah, from yeah, the beginning. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll just continue. Okay. So okay. actually. Anthropology is very, very young as an academic, like as an official academic uh, discipline. And my college actually has the only anthropology program in the country at the moment. And it's so young that we only graduated our first batch of anthropology students this uh, summer uh, in, in uh, June of 2021. Um, and so they started, this is, this is them. Um, uh, after a talk we had by a uh, Bhutanese anthropologist, he's in the center, uh, Dr. Karapin. So, so it's, 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 it's a very, very young discipline if we're looking at it um, from an academic standpoint in terms of, uh, of it being offered to Bhutanese students to, to learn. Um, and I think uh, most, I guess all of the uh, people who have PhDs in anthropology who are Bhutanese had to study outside the country. Um, so the program was only recently validated. It's uh, the BA in anthropology was validated only in 2017. Um, and this is a photo from the validation process. It's quite an intensive, extensive um, process uh, that, that is multi-year. It takes maybe about two years to get a program passed. Um, and there are there's sort of various stages where they do resource checks and things like that. And then this is where we actually sit for three days and go over each of the modules with the university to make sure um, that they feel ready to offer the degree. Um, and until, until the BA in anthropology was offered, the only social sciences offered in the country were sociology and political science. It's a joint degree, economics and geography, which, which to a certain extent is a social science uh, and, and also a physical science, but that's also offered. Um, and uh, sociology and political science had one model, module, one class in cultural anthropology. So that was sort of before uh, it was offered, there, there was no way for uh, a young Bhutanese to study um, this course. Um, and actually, and I'll talk a lot more about Dorji Benjur, but he's, he's probably one of the best known Bhutanese anthropologists. And he wrote an article in 2013 on the state of anthropology in Bhutan. And he said, um, the hallmark of Bhutanese nationhood is founded on the national goal of preserving and promoting its unique cultural identity. And that's, that's actually enshrined in our constitution. And that's also part of uh, one of the pillars in GNH. So we take it very seriously, this idea that our cultural identity is, is uh, key to our sovereignty, to our identity. Um, and then he goes on to say, how paradoxical is it that anthropology is neither taught in Bhutanese colleges, nor is there a formal anthropological study of Bhutan? So I think I think we we definitely use this line when we were um, uh, 
convincing the, the university that we should be allowed to offer anthropology. But I think it, it was definitely true that it was probably a, a discipline that was well suited for uh, sort of larger national goals. Um, and yet until 2018, it was, it was not available um, at any uh, institution within the country. So, um, however, in the pipeline, there's also a PhD in anthropology that's been proposed. Uh, we only have one, we actually have two universities. One is the medical college and then everything else falls under the Royal University of Bhutan. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. Uh, but there is a PhD in anthropology uh, being proposed. Um, it's yet to be validated and it would be offered at the College of Language and Cultural Studies. CLCS, and you can see a picture of it. It's in central Bhutan, so it's a little bit, uh, it's quite far from the capital, maybe about five or six hours drive. Um, and what's very interesting about CLCS is it's one of the few institutions in Bhutan that is truly bilingual, that offers instruction both in our national language, uh, Zonka, and in English. Um, and students are sort of expected to move seamlessly between classes offered in either language. And it's really the only institution that's quite like that. Um, uh, our, our medium of instruction in most of our uh, secular education is in English. So this, this uh, PhD uh, program, the, the groundwork for it was funded by a grant from the Werner Grant Foundation. Um, and I think it's a five-year grant uh, where they kind of work on developing it. Um, and I think they're hopeful that in the next year, they might be already able to admit students. But um, like I said, it still has to be validated by, by the university. And if it comes through, it would be the second PhD program in Bhutan. At the moment, there is only one uh, PhD offered in climate science at uh, the, the College of Natural Resources. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about Bhutanese scholarship in general, um, not just anthropology, and then sort of show where anthropology fits in. So we have a very long, old, rich tradition of religious scholarship. Much of that literature is written in Chiki. Uh, which is not a spoken language, it's, it's classical Tibetan, so it's not uh, uh, in our national language Dzongkha. Um, Dzongkha actually is the, a language that has only recently become a written language, before that everything was written in Chuki. Um, and much of what we see in the scholarship there is religious, so there's a lot of hagiographies, uh, a lot of sort of religious um, uh, theoretical texts. Um, and uh, until the 1950s, when we uh, had the introduction of modern Western style schooling, this was the only education tradition, only form of scholarship available in the country, um, which has certain implications. It meant that uh, it was a uh, people, there were a lot of people who didn't have access to it. Um, for example, women were largely left out. Um, uh, and of course, it meant that lay people were largely left out. Most of our scholarship was in the hands of, uh, of monks and religious personalities. So um, our, our Western style education started in the 1950s and 60s. Before that, um, there were some uh, small number of students who were sent for schooling in India. Um, and of course, the goals of the education system are very much tied to uh, ideas around uh, development and progress um, and sort of thinking about what, what the nation needs. Um, so the, the secular schooling is largely English medium. We do have a monastic schooling uh, that continues the tradition um, of the past and that runs parallel to it. Um, very interestingly, I was recently talking to uh, the Kempo in charge of uh, curriculum in the monastic schooling, and they've decided that they need to include uh, a little bit more English instruction because they feel that without that, they're not preparing their, their monks for the modern world. So that's that's quite interesting. Um, so the schooling system is, is 50s, 60s, which is fairly young, and our university is actually even younger. Um, we had a college in the east called Sherapsi, um, and for a long time it was the sort of the, the school that was, um, how do you say, where you could get the most advanced training. They, they offered some pre-university courses, um, and it, for a long time it was the only place where you could do high school. And in 1983, it became an affiliate of the Delhi University system, which meant all the exams were flown in to uh, 
this this sort of remote area in eastern Bhutan and then flown out and um, everyone who had the degree actually um, had the degree from the University of Delhi. Uh, and then in 2003, by royal decree, so uh, by uh, His Majesty's command, the Royal University of Bhutan was founded. The idea was that we would uh, start to award our own degrees and that our programs would uh, better reflect the Bhutanese context because of course until then even the college that was in the country was also basically using a curriculum developed in uh, Delhi. Um, so at the moment the Royal University of Bhutan is one of two university systems as I mentioned before. Um, the other university system is the uh, is the medical university so they, they only offer um, medical degrees, nursing, counseling, those sorts of things. So all the colleges in the country that are not medical fall under the Royal University of Bhutan, including my college. So there are currently nine constituent colleges um, that are, these are government colleges under the Royal University of Bhutan and two affiliate colleges, which are the two private colleges, um, which means that basically all of our degree programs are still overseen by the Royal University of Bhutan and our degrees are um, eventually awarded by them. And of course that uh, means that they sort of have um, a lot of advice to give on what kind of degree programs they feel the nation needs. And so anything um, that a college proposes, um, has to, we have to demonstrate that there is a national need for it. Um, so uh, I'll talk, talk a little bit about the early writing on Bhutan. Um, a lot of it um, we already, I already mentioned that the early writing from the Bhutanese side was largely religious. And so when we're looking for themes that were non-religious, that were really telling us... Yes, uh, Dr. Dr. Doda, yes. Uh, sorry for disturbing you again. Uh, can yes. you change your slides? It shows only the 2021 past home ground and... Oh, I don't know. Yes. Has it, is it, okay. Right. I don't know. It's, sorry. It's changing on okay, mine. No is now is it show, what is it showing now yes yes early writing on bhutan yes okay so maybe i have to go back and forth to make sure it's visible okay no problem you can yeah. you can yeah. start from now yeah I'll, I'll just do that. So uh, like I was saying before, um, most of the early writing on the kinds of things that anthropologists are particularly interested on, like, you know, what were people wearing, what crops were being grown, how were people interacting, that largely came from um, uh, foreign accounts. Uh, we had several British missions that came into the country. Uh, there was a, a, a Portuguese Jesuits that visited. They were actually heading north towards Tibet. But um, the, this this becomes uh, very important sources of sort of telling us what uh, Bhutan was like, uh, historically speaking. Um, we also had uh, many Indians who lived and worked in Bhutan from the 1960s onwards, and they wrote on a lot of different topics that are, again, very useful to uh, anthropologists. Um, so they were looking at everything from culture to politics and the environment. But until this until this point, there were not there was not much Bhutanese writing on topics that were not uh, religious. Um, so I'll just move to the next slide. Okay. So in the 70s and 80s, we had probably our first actual anthropological studies. And these were done by uh, a very small handful of very select scholars. Um, that, and what's interesting with the Bhutanese anthropological, I don't know if we can call it a tradition yet. It's, it's probably too short-lived to be a tradition, is that it's it's been very mixed in terms of, of the influences. So. Um, some of our early scholars were uh, from the UK, from France, from Japan, um, from Switzerland. Um, so some of the early work was what's what we would think of as more ethno-historical, particularly using understandings of our religious past, particularly using textual work. So Michael Aries, Francois Pomeroy, Yishiro. Um, and we also had some very early linguistic work during this period by George Van Driem. Um, he's probably the first to study Tsongkha from an uh, from a anthropological uh, standpoint. Um, there, we continue to have a small number of outside scholars. Um, it's still uh, very complicated to get permission to study in Bhutan. Um, and uh, their work is largely, uh, of, course, of course, there's some diversity, but largely scholars from the outside continue to be very interested in Buddhism and more recently uh, very interested in GNH and development and the environment sort of connected to each other. So we do, 
we do see uh, some uh, ways in which Bhutan has become, um, the, you know, the, the, uh, a site for anthropological study itself. What's very interesting is that despite the lack of anthropological training in the country, as I mentioned before, our program, which started just uh, three and a half years ago, was the first, there have been quite a few Bhutanese who have gone outside the country to pursue uh, anthropology. Um, and they've gotten degrees from all over Europe, the United States, and of course, increasingly uh, in Australia. I think the last two Bhutanese to get PhDs in anthropology were at the Australian National University. So you, you see sort of a very uh, diverse uh, background in terms of the influences coming into what, what is Bhutanese anthropology. And I think in some ways it might be the social science with the largest number of PhDs. So um, there are probably social sciences like psychology and sociology might have more Bhutanese who have gone up to the bachelor's level. But when we're looking at PhDs, um, they're very, there are probably uh, comparatively more from anthropology. However, very few of them work in academia. Um, and I think that's largely to do with um, the way in which uh, uh, sort of the, the way in which people are recruited into uh, academic institutions, as well as the kind of opportunities that are and are not available out there. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, sorry. Um, so I was very lucky when I was developing um, this presentation because there are actually two very important articles that have attempted to trace the history of anthropology in Bhutan. Um, one written in 2000 by uh, Francois Pomeroy and one written in 2013 by Dorji Penjur. Um, both of them are very well regarded senior anthropologists in Bhutan with very prolific publication records. They're definitely considered uh, experts. Uh, uh, Francois Pomeroy is long associated with the College of Language and Cultural Studies, and um, she is part of the team that is uh, attempting to bring uh, a PhD in anthropology to that institution. While Dr. Dorji Penjur is with, until recently, he was with the Center for Bhutan Studies, which is, uh, I think, the first and still only autonomous research institution, uh, which was founded in 1999. And, and they have been at the center of most of the research on Bhutan done by Bhutanese, as well as a lot of the early surveys of uh, GNH and how it's operating. So they're very uh, important parts of uh, the scholarly landscape in Bhutan. Um, what's interesting is they, uh, they have very different conclusions about the history of anthropology. I mean, there are some similarities, but there's some very interesting differences. And I think um, that uh, that actually sort of indicates how, um, I, I think when people start to disagree, it means that there, there's, there's interesting things happening. So they have very different ideas about when anthropology uh, started in Bhutan. And I, I, I think it shows, um, it, it shows that, uh, you know, the history is complex to sort of trace. So, um, oh, let me make sure that you can see this. Um, so um, this is Francoise, you can see her on the, uh, on the slide. Um, and she, uh, her article is looking at recent Bhutanese scholarship. And so she's not looking at scholarship on Bhutan, but she's really interested in Bhutanese writing in history and anthropology. And of course, by combining history and anthropology, you see that, uh, that early um, emphasis on anthropology from a more ethno-historical point of view. Her, her, her article is mostly a survey. She's looking at what's been written. And what she argues from the start is that uh, while anthropology might be recent, she sees it as the offspring of, of a long tradition of Bhutanese scholarship. Um, and I think that that's really important that she, and, and to a certain extent, Dorji Bender, call back on this very rich uh, religious textual um, scholarship that we have in the country, um, even though uh, the focus of what the scholarship was looking at, it's it sort of focus, it's uh, the directions it was heading is very different from uh, what anthropologists typically write about. Um, she also traces the start of um, local anthropological scholarship as linked to um, Western education. The, the, that once we were able to uh, 
produce works in English. Um, we were able to read what was what was coming in terms of Western methodologies. Uh, it it, uh, it allowed us to, to get closer to what is anthropological uh, literature. And I think what she sees as particularly important that was missing in the older religious uh, sort of texts is that there was very little discussion of socioeconomics or culture. Um, that, that context that's so key to anthropology, um, you, you, it was not present in that more traditional uh, scholarship. However, she's very, um, I guess, very generous in seeing um, that there are works that might not be anthropological, but what they are what she calls unknowingly ethnographic. Um, and she points to the fact that in Bhutan, long before um, other areas in the Himalayas, we had a lot of local uh, scholars without the prompting of any sort of outside influences, um, feeling that they needed to document um, what, you know, the traditional Bhutanese culture. So you had the moment that people were writing books and publishing books in English, they were starting to collect oral histories like folk tales. They were starting to uh, make inventories of material culture and photograph them. So looking at things like, for example, our national dress, the Kira, um, as well as looking at heritage. And she was saying that even those, these are not uh, the outcome of, of sort of a, a traditional anthropological training, they offer a lot of the rich detail that's key to ethnography. And so she's, she, she, she sees that these and this the early scholarship uh, from the religious school as really sort of interest, important to include when we're thinking about the history of the discipline of anthropology in, in Bhutan. Um, okay. What's interesting, though, is that she sees, um, in some ways, our, our religious scholarship as perhaps, uh, the history of religious scholarship as perhaps offering um, some challenges to what we're doing. The first is that um, because of this, we were not necessarily learning the, the vocabulary, the methods, the theory that allowed uh, local scholars to participate in larger global discussions and international exchanges. And she sees this as, as really sort of key to put these scholars standing alongside um, other anthropologists working on Bhutan or working on similar topics in other parts of the world. And she, she I mean, I think in some ways this is an argument for uh, including anthropology in um, the, the structured academic setting. The other thing she sees as difficult is that Previous Bhutanese scholars uh, who were working in religious, uh, more religious contexts, I mean, their, their religious beliefs uh, were part of their scholarship. And now it's become maybe a little bit harder uh, to reconcile uh, some of the ways in which um, religious scholarship has people think with uh, sort of a more critical, more um, scientific uh, approach. But that's at least her her argument is that perhaps for some Bhutanese academics, this might be a challenge to, to sort of uh, match what's expected in a more um, global, uh, traditional context there. So that, that sort of is her arguments for, um, for the history of anthropology, at least until 2000. And then in 2013, Dorji Penjo, who you see in this picture, and he's one of uh, one of the early uh, Bhutanese anthropologists. He was a researcher at the Center for Bhutan Studies for many years, and then um, he was in Australia at the Australian National University to get his uh, PhD. And he actually argues, and this is a, this is a later article, 2013. He argues that there is no such a thing as uh, Bhutanese anthropology yet. He, he sort of um, sees there as being some important uh, um, predecessors, but he, he, he feels that there, there, there's not something we can quite call anthropology in Bhutan yet. Um, and so he talks a little bit about the work that anthropologists might be uh, might uh, consider uh, of interest. Um, and he observes that most of the work that could be, uh, oh, it should be minorities, not my 
minority, sorry, that's a typo. But he was saying that, first of all, most of what could be considered anthropological looks at minorities, um, and these are three that have been studied quite a lot, the Brokpa, who are the herders that live in Eastern Bhutan, the Hops, which are uh, uh, in Southern Bhutan, which are quite a uh, uh, an old but very different from mainstream Bhutanese society and the Monpas who are found in central Bhutan. So he, he argues that first of all we're not really looking at Bhutan as a whole in these studies and he also and I don't know if I completely agree with him I mean this is this is definitely his opinion but he feels that almost everything written by a non-Bhutanese on Bhutan is inaccurate um, and that it's it's sort of up to Bhutanese scholars to correct and rewrite it. I don't know if, if, if he's completely accurate and of course I mean, every ethnography has its weaknesses and strengths, so I don't know if it's fair to be as critical as he's being, but he, he generally feels that everything that's been written is sort of, uh, he doesn't want to quite include it yet in the anthropology of Bhutan. He draws that line a little bit um, later. So he considers the first uh, Bhutanese and the beginning of anthropology of Bhutan to be um, with this particular text um, by Frederick Barth and Uni Wicken, who are uh, very well known uh, Norwegian anthropologists who in the late 1980s had come to Bhutan as consultants for UNICEF and they had been asked to look at what was happening with uh, children in Bhutan and they, they did sort of field work for maybe about uh, about three or four months, um, but, genu but genuinely doing the, the sort of participant observation that is hallmark of anthropology. Um, and so their work was initially published as a, a report for UNICEF. And then in 2011, uh, the Center for Bhutan Studies uh, published it as a publication. And, and you can see the new title becomes Situation of Children in Bhutan, an Anthropological Perspective. And this certainly has some very uh, valuable insights in it. I think in particular, it uh, dispels a lot of our, um, our myths about what Bhutanese families used to be like in the past. So it's definitely a very important document. But it also sort of, in uh, in seeing this as the start of anthropology of Bhutan, Doji Benjo makes it very clear that for him, uh, the, the discipline has to be professionalized and institutionalized. You need to have uh, anthropologists like Frederick Barth and Uni Wicken who are attached to a university in Norway with, with, with an anthropology uh, department for him to consider it anthropology. So he, he doesn't count the work uh, that uh, Francois Pomeroy was counting, all of those early accounts of early oral history or uh, documenting of different kinds of material culture to be anthropology of Bhutan yet. Um, and he also points to the importance of our schooling system, but he makes a really important point, and which is that the new education system, when it came into being, had a really strong bias towards the sciences. Um, and again, this might partially be because of uh, the way in which the education system was so closely tied to nation building, to the idea of what the nation needed. So the very best students were pushed in uh, the direction of science, and a lot of them ended up doing things like medicine or engineering, occasionally architecture. Um, and, and he felt that this sort of um, this bias, this preference, um, actually might have slowed the growth of social science um, for a long, long time. Um, as you can see, the, I mean, we only had our first, I think even the sociology and political science program had their first intake of students only in 2008. So, so it's, it's, it's quite a late uh, start of, of uh, having social science in the country. What's, what's really interesting is that when he thinks about um, the beginning of Bhutanese during anthropology, he says it's only during the last few years, and he wrote this in 2013, that civil servants like himself, working in research and academic institutions like the Center of Bhutan Studies and the Royal University of Bhutan, had chosen to study anthropology and sociology for their graduate study. This is indeed the beginning of a Bhutanese anthropology, so an anthropology done by Bhutanese. Um, and I think, I think it's fair enough uh, for him to make this claim. However, I think this does leave out um, some very early anthropologists who uh, were um, sort of predate both the Center for Bhutan Studies and the Royal University of Bhutan, but perhaps 
they are not as well recognized and seen because they were not academic institutions like CBS or the Royal University to absorb them. So I think, for example, about uh, Dr. Tandon Dor uh, Dorji, who is uh, currently the president for the other private college in Bhutan, uh, Norberlin Richter College, and he got his anthropology PhD in France um, well before, I think probably before 2000. However, he has continued to work mostly at academic institutions as an administrator. So in some ways, he doesn't get counted, even though he has done interesting uh, research and um, and, and I think he's still a very important uh, part of the history of anthropology in Bhutan. So on, on the side, you see um, a book that uh, that is one of the first ethnographies uh, written by a Bhutanese, and it's by Dorji Penjo. It's based on his master's research, and he's looking at courtship practices in a particular village in central Bhutan. And this is, this is sort of... Uh, I don't know if it can be classic, called classic from it since it's only 2009, but it's a very important uh, part of the literature for us. Um, and I'm just showing you a couple of the other, oh, let me see, make sure you guys can see this. So um, like, I, like I was saying earlier, there are quite a few anthropologists who, uh, who have the PhD in anthropology and are not working in anthropology. They found other fields to work in and they're, they're often quite eminent in these fields. So a classic example of, of this is His Excellency Dr. Sonam Kinga, who uh, got his PhD at the University of Kyoto. And he was for a long time um, the chairperson of our national council. Um, and he has actually written, published extensively in terms of uh, what might be considered anthropological research. His most recent book, uh, Democratic Transition in Bhutan, Political Contests as Moral Battles, is actually probably our first uh, political ethnography. Um, so there are, uh, there are Bhutanese anthropologists, but maybe they're not always visible because of where, where, where they're working. Um, oh. And of course, we continue to have a handful of foreign anthropologists um, bringing out. I'm just showing you the book covers because they're they're more interesting to look at than articles. Uh, but this sort of gives you a smattering of um, the other uh, foreign um, anthro uh, foreign anthropologists who have been doing ethnography in Bhutan. Um, we have one book that's more a linguistic. Uh, study uh, of um, Eastern Bhutan uh, by a Dutch anthropologist, and a second one that looks at gender and sustainability also by a, a Dutch anthropologist. And this is the most recent one. This is by an American anthropologist looking at healthcare, sort of more medical anthropological view. Um, I thought I'd also talk a little bit because we've talked about the importance of uh, culture to Bhutan's um, uh, sort of national identity. And so I thought I would talk about a couple other recent projects that have uh, used anthropological insights or anthropological impulses or have even had anthropologists working with them um, that I think in the long run will be really important to the history of anthropology in Bhutan, but these are all still very much um, new. So this was a project that was um, funded by the European Union and then carried out by Helvetus, who is uh, uh, a Swiss non-NGO uh, working in Bhutan, and they were really concerned with sort of documenting cultural diversity. Um, and so they looked at four uh, fairly remote communities in different parts of Bhutan, and they wanted to both document their culture, but also document their experience with modernization, globalization, um, change. Um, and so they came out, what they did is they contracted academics to document each of these, these cultures. And they, they use participant observation, but um, probably uh, for a much shorter span than most anthropologists would prefer to do. Um, and they landed up coming out with one uh, more academic uh, text, that's the one that's called Twilight Cultures, and one that was more for a general audience. It has a lot of photographs and talks, uh, sort of um, uh, talks about it at, at a much more um, simple level. So I think these will be very important uh, texts 
later on, particularly because I think all uh, four of the communities that are documented are, ch are, ch are changing very, very quickly. Um, another thing that's being done is at the College of Language and Cultural Studies, which is where the PhD is planned. And I think this, this is, again, why that institution is well placed to consider uh, a PhD in anthropology is they've been working on something called the Bhutan Cultural Atlas since 2011. And this is something that was funded by UNESCO and they're sort of documenting uh, both tangible and intangible heritage in Bhutan. They, I think it's been a, a little bit of a slow process. They've sent, started in central Bhutan uh, in a district called Bumtham, but they've reached out and they've got um, two or three other districts. The interesting thing with the cultural atlas is that they want it to be um, accessible to everyone. So um, this is in their own words, what they're doing is that they are mapping um, tangible and intangible assets and they're thinking about how they're linked to culture and community development and they're sort of um, thinking about culture as a resource that could be optimized. So very much using um, sort of development language when thinking about culture, but maybe also maybe uh, providing a defense for culture in the face of sort of um, development that takes a more uh, economic um, approach. So the cultural atlas is actually available online. You can go and take a look. Um, and so uh, you can see that it, it, it has um, a lot of different aspects of Bhutanese culture that have been documented and that people can explore. Um, it's pretty static. They, they are not using any videos. They've collected a lot of video and so they have the video archive, but most of it um, is in the form of text or uh, photographs. Um, so that, that's what the site looks for. If you go under intangible heritage, if you go under that link, this is what you get. So you see each of the different zongkaks and then you can kind of look at different uh, different kinds of practices or festivals or um, beliefs. Uh, and here's an example of one. This is uh, the, a document. This would be how they would document one particular uh, uh, religious um, festival that happens in Bhutan. So you can see they've got photographs and then a description. Um, and so I think that that's, this is this is very much still where Bhutanese anthropology is. Um, when you read a lot of the work written by Bhutanese anthropologists, we're still very much at the stage of, of doing descriptive um, documentation. It's not yet very theoretical. Um, but I think it's still important work. Um, another project that's um, even more sophisticated, it's the Bhutan Cultural Library. And this was something that was done with uh, an agency in Bhutan called Shijin, that's now, it's now called Loden, um, and that they worked with the University of Virginia um, to collect a lot of data. They have about um, 3,000 hours of video recording, 100,000 photographs. They also combined it with trying to uh, do photo documentation of archival sources, sort of digitizing books to make them more available. And some of this is now available online at the Bhutan Cultural Library, which is accessible to anyone. So again, this is very much about documenting culture um, and, and potentially making it available to others. Um, so I'll just show you what they claim. They, they're also, again, thinking about um, oral cultures, embodied cultures, um, and they're also thinking about the pressures of globalization um, in terms of cultural change. So I, I think this and the cultural atlas and a lot of anthropology in Bhutan share this concern that cultural change is disruptive. And so um, there are practices, traditions, uh, beliefs that need to be documented before they're lost. Uh, we actually have a great site. This is what it looks at, like. Um, they have, uh, they're have they a little bit more dynamic than the cultural atlas, so they have a lot of uh, audio and video recording. Um, and it's quite layered and interactive. Um, so, for example, uh, this is um, a recording of a traditional Bhutanese song. And so you can listen to the women singing the song. But then you also have a transcript and they have done the transcripts 
both in Zonka and in English to make it more accessible. So, so, so it, it has a couple more layers that, um, I mean, like I said before, it's mostly descriptive, but I think something like this, um, like opens itself up to be used again by maybe another anthropologist um, in a more analytical, uh, theoretical manner. Um, so the other thing that I really appreciate about the Bhutan culture, uh, about this particular project is um, it doesn't seem to uh, have an assumption of what Bhutanese culture should look like. So um, they do a lot of documentation of very ordinary everyday life. Like for example, this is uh, from uh, photographs looking at sort of labor exchanges that happen um, in rural Bhutan where, you know, where, where villagers are helping each other um, to, uh, to plant baddy or harvest it. Um, so I, I think I think this this has the potential to be incredibly useful to to later anthropologists or even ones uh, currently working in this area. Um, all right. So I think um, the future of Bhutanese anthropology is is. Uh, is exciting because there's so much that's unexplored. There is still far more encouragement and funding for documenting traditional uh, tradition and culture, like you saw with the, with the two projects I just, with the three projects I discussed. Um, but contemporary life and practices, urban experiences, cultural change, they are being studied in smaller ways, but they're largely unexplored. So that's really exciting. That that leaves a lot of room for um, for emerging Bhutanese anthropology. Um, but I think um, they're not yet uh, as explored. So. That kind of sums up uh, where Bhutanese anthropology is. I thought I'd talk a little bit about archaeology in Bhutan, since they're often associated with each other. And this is even perhaps less developed than uh, anthropology in Bhutan. There are a lot of really interesting archaeological sites um, that haven't been really studied or documented in any systematic way. For example, this is, uh, this is the picture is of a monolith in southern Bhutan. Um, and there are a lot of sort of stories around what it might mean, but it hasn't been um, documented in any way. Um, and archaeologists perhaps have an even harder time because we do not yet have any laws that protect uh, these kinds of sites, which means that sometimes they are inadvertently destroyed or damaged uh, because of a road being built or uh, because of agricultural work. Um, in fact, we only have one trained archaeologist in the country, Dr. Kinga Wongma, and while she is um, she's connected to academic institutions, for example, Sharapsi has a center for archaeological and historical research, um, they, but they don't offer any uh, academic courses, and so she's associated with that, but she's actually not uh, primarily um, employed by any academic institution. So that sort of uh, leaves archaeology a little bit outside of um, academic institutions at the moment. Um, I think the only place where it is institutionalized is in the Department of Culture. So within a government organization, they do have a unit on archaeology, which is responsible for that. Um, there is some talk about maybe uh, um, introducing archaeology in one of the colleges, but it's, it's at a very early stage at this point. Uh, so this, this gives you sort of an understanding of um, how recent the idea that archaeology is important is. So if, um, there's a, quite a well-known uh, structure in eastern Bhutan called Bangso, and it's sort of an underground fortress. It's, it's, it's supposed to be nine stories uh, deep. Um, and even in the 1990s, we saw uh, district administrators uh, sort of excavating, um, but not really excavating, sort of just opening it up without without really um, having an archaeologist present who could help them do it systematically, who could make sure things were recorded. So in the end, um, I think they might have actually done quite a lot of damage. Um, they just got local people in to help them sort of open it up. And I'll show you some pictures of it so you can see where you would enter from the top. It would be quite easy to destroy. So we see sites like this actually um, not being protected and not being studied in the way that they should. So here is the structure on the inside. 
this is what it looks like. Uh, it's quite it's quite impressive. And this would be the entrance where you have to enter from the top and go downwards. So you can see how easy it would be to uh, damage it. Can you see that? Is that visible? Sorry. So that's that's how it looks on the inside. And this would, this would have been the entrance. Um, and you can see that the, the site has almost no artifacts. So it's quite likely that it had been looted in the past, um, perhaps not intentionally, perhaps um, some, some of the artifacts were just found and, and people weren't sure what they were. So um, maybe they were carried away or, or sometimes you see the stones reused in construction. Um, more recent attempt to do a proper archaeological study um, happened in 2008. So you can again see this is very, very recent. And this would actually be the first um, proper scientific archaeological study that was done in Bhutan. This was found, uh, funded by the Swiss Liechtenstein Foundation for Archaeological Research Abroad, and it was a multi-year project. And this is the site that they looked at. Um, it's a Zong in central Bhutan. And Zongs were um, administrative and religious uh, centers, so they would have been where um, they would have had a body of monks, but it would also have been uh, where where local administration uh, took. Uh, took place. Um, so it's believed to have been built in about the 16th century, um, and which is interesting for us as Bhutanese because that predates the unification of the country. Um, it predates the arrival of Shaktung Naung Namgyal, who, who sort of united the country. So, so that this has some pretty important historical um, significance. Um, the Dzong is also in a very uh, interesting location because it's quite strategic. Um, it would have uh, been in a position to, to oversee the sort of the coming and going between Bhutan and Tibet. And then, of course, until um, until the border was closed, um, that the, Tibet was the main place that Bhutan was trading with. Um, so at this particular site, they were able to find the bones of some domestic animals as well as some weapons. Um, and all of this sort of suggests that it might have been a major, uh, a major garrison. Let me just show you some of the objects that were found there. Um, Sorry, this is such a poor uh, photograph. It's just from the national newspaper, but it kind of shows you um, the, the artifacts that were recovered from it. Um, and so this the site is kind of an interesting and important one, um, particularly because it was, it was properly documented in an uh, archaeological um, manner. And so the Ministry of Culture is actually, and, and these plans have not gone ahead because of, uh, of COVID, but they actually are interested in opening this site as, as sort of um, uh, something that would be open to the public for them to come and learn about prehistory. So, so I think that that's, that's quite promising. And I think that that would definitely help uh, more Bhutanese to, to understand uh, the, what archaeology has to offer us in terms of having a better understanding of our past. Um, however, what's really interesting is that, and this is from an article, uh, Dorje Penders, as I mentioned, he's very prolific, so he wrote about uh, the state of anthropology in Bhutan. He also wrote about the state of archaeology in Bhutan in 2007. And what he said is what's very interesting is um, even as we try to interpret the prehistory, even though Buddhism was not present in the prehistory, um, often what we see is interpretations of prehistory at the moment. And this is probably why uh, archaeology could offer another lens to look at prehistory, is that um, Buddhism, Buddhist meanings often are superimposed uh, on top of any um, sort of uh, prehistorical artifacts or feature or anything that's found. Um, it usually lands up being invested with Buddhist meanings, which, which I mean, I think this is true of, of all study of the past is we do it from the perspective of the present. But I think archaeology offers us another way in which to think about these artifacts and places. I'll show you a picture of a sort of a cave painting. Um, so this is this is a cave painting that was found uh, by uh, the archaeologist I mentioned, Dr. King Wangmo. It's 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 in an area a little bit north of us in Gaza. And what she found so interesting is you had uh, a painting, um, and then uh, a cave painting, and superimposed on it was uh, Buddhist inscriptions. And I think that that um, that 
that that ma that makes the archaeology of Bhutan all the more interesting because you can sort of see the different historical layers as 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 we see uh, the Buddhist present and recent past uh, on top of uh, the prehistory. But of course, again, this is why um, scientific study archaeology offers us uh, probably uh, a, a, a different understanding of our prehistory and um, what Bhutan was like um, in the past. So I think this is my this is my final slide. I just wanted to uh, ooh, why is it doing that from current slide? I just wanted to project uh, the references in case anyone was uh, interested in uh, looking them up. You can again see the Journal of Bhutan Studies, which is uh, put out by the Center for Bhutan Studies. is such an important part of our um, scholarly landscape here in Bhutan. Um, so that's it. <laughs> As I mentioned, it's very, very short. Um, but if there are any specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, Dr. Talaka, not I can talk. Oh, I see thank a you question. Very much. Thank, yeah, you. thank you very much, madam, for the informative presentation and very attractive presentation. Very, uh, we received more knowledge about the Bhutan anthropology and the history mm -hmm. and the development. Thank you very much for the um, nicely nicely done presentation and the uh, knowledge that you provided throughout the presentation. I would like to request if anyone have questions or concerns regarding the lecture, uh, you can now uh, raise your thoughts. I yes. think there's some in the there's some in the chat box. Uh, yeah. Should I answer them? Yes. So yes, first, yes. the first question is, what do people think in Bhutan mm -hmm. think about Arunachal Pradesh? I, I mean, I can't speak for the entire country, but we, we do have very interesting connections to Arunachal Pradesh, particularly in the east of Bhutan, where the border is quite porous. So um, I, I think there, there, there's a lot of um, linguistic similarities and even some uh, religious similarities. And some of the festivals in uh, the east, you, you see as many people from Arunachal Pradesh as you do local people of course now you see a lot of tourists but in the past we had people from Arunachal coming across the border to uh, celebrate important festivals with us and there were there were uh, intermarriages and things like that happening too um, then the next question is why anthropology subject is not taught in other colleges in Bhutan I think I think there's quite a few reasons for that the first is um, they don't they try not to introduce subjects where we don't have local people to teach and so uh, the human resource constraint is really important. Um, the other thing is they don't want to have all the, the subjects, the, each of the colleges teaches something different, right? So uh, for example, the, uh, the we have an engineering college which just mostly teaches engineering. We have the two teaching colleges only offer that. So they try and um, try and not have uh, one university with everything and they try and spread that across the country so that, for example, they don't want to have uh, a lot of colleges in the same place in part to sort of make sure uh, development is spread around the country. So I think that's part of it. Um, I think also it's not that there's anything against anthropology, it's that social science is new. And so I think um, we, we still, even when we are um, doing admission, I still get a lot of phone calls from parents and, and students asking, what will we be studying? Uh, what is the scope? Everyone wants to know what, what jobs they'll get. So I think it's partially because it's a new subject. Um, so there isn't a, a lot of demand yet. Um, and also we're a small country, so I don't think every college can offer every subject. Uh, then how different is Buddhism in Bhutan from India, are natural in specific? Um, I. I am not very much a Buddhist scholar. I think there's some very interesting similarities between what you see, what I've seen in terms of uh, temples in Arunachal and in Bhutan. Um, so I think there, there are some important similarities. I think the differences might partially be based on things like state support. Our, our government uh, supports uh, the official uh, monastic structure. I mean, the, their budget and also comes from the government. So that definitely creates opportunities um, that are not present maybe in our natural. So for example, students enrolled in monastic school are still supported by the government if you're in a government monastery. And that, that definitely encourages more, uh, more, more students 
religions to, to, to join state monasteries for that reason. But I think in terms of uh, ritual and maybe beliefs, there might be more, mostly minor differences, I think. Um, particularly, I think we'll see more similarities across the Himalayas than, than differences would be my feeling. Any other Thank questions you for the from questions. the yeah. Yeah. Thank Any you other for questions? Those. Concerns from the uh, participants, please. You're welcome. <laughs> now uh, I think uh, I think uh, we have a we should have some conversation with Professor Unita. Professor Unita, are you there? Do, do oh, someone else, has, someone else has asked about similarities or differences with Sikkim. I, I think it's, it's a little bit like Arunachal, there, there are some important similarities. And of course, even with Sikkim, we have some important historical connections. Uh, our, our royal grandmother is from the Sikkimese royal family, so they're, they're, those connections are really important. Um, I think, I, I don't know how much you know about uh, Buddhism in, in the Himalayas, but, but there are, even though it looks very similar, there are a couple different schools. Um, and, and to an outsider, the, the differences are not that important. Um, but there are uh, Bhutanis who, who follow teachers in Sikkim. They, they prefer to do those, those teachers that are there. So I think there's enough uh, similarities that, that there, there's, there's, there, there are these important connections. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think now, uh, Professor Nisha, uh, yes. Put, yes. I, I think Professor Unita, can you uh, put your comment in the lecture of Dr. Dalma? <laughs> Yeah, so thank you very much, Dorma, for for your uh, detailed uh, explanation. Yeah, about the history, the development. Even though it is still young, but anyway, <laughs> you presented uh, such in a good order. I just thank wonder. You. Uh, you mentioned about some uh, ethnic groups, yeah? ethnic groups mm -hmm. or communities. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the main similarities and differences between those three three major communities? Are these yeah. the different language or they can yes. understand one another? And what is the lingua franca for all people there? And mm -hmm. uh, to what extent are there some other religions besides this? Yeah? Is there any yeah. also... Uh, special i don't know when, when when you compare it with the india but like uh, mahayana and hinayana yes there's two different buddhists in in southeast asia like in the south sri lanka india etc more uh, cambodia more hinayana rather than mahayana so can you explain about that uh, cultural differences yeah yeah thank sure. you so uh, Bhutan is really interesting. There's a lot of diversity linguistically and culturally. Um, and I think maybe that's partially because of all the, the way it is geographically, that the communities were quite isolated from each other. So even though we've got a small population, there were about, it depends who you ask, but there are between 19 to 21 different languages in the country. Um, the national language is Tsongkha, which was uh, spoken in the past mostly in the West, Western Bhutan, but now that's become a very important uh, language for nation building. Um, but, but many people still speak uh, their local languages at home. Many of those languages are not written. So uh, most of them are mainly oral, um, but but they they have rich histories and and traditions too, um, and of course in the in the uh, the plains of Bhutan, southern Bhutan, we have um, quite a, a lot of groups who are ethnically Nepali. So of course they are uh, some of them are Buddhist, some of them are Hindu. Um, they have they have their own language. Uh, some some of them speak Nepali. Some of them have. Uh, other sort of ethnic languages. So uh, a lot of, there, there is a lot of diversity. Um, some of the, the smaller ethnic groups we, uh, that I talked about earlier, like the Hops and the Monpas, they did have their own um, 
uh, religious beliefs that's become quite mixed with Buddhism in part because Buddhism is this great umbrella that seems to be able to mix and match with sort of local traditions. We, we see that across the Himalayas. So uh, that's that's true. Um, I think in terms of the type of Buddhism we are, uh, we, we're, we're, we're mostly uh, Tibetan Buddhist, various schools, but uh, that's considered uh, under Mahayana Buddhism, but a, a little bit different from other Mahayana Buddhists. Um, so they have sort of uh, a belief system that is um, much more typical of the Himalayas and, and definitely so there there's some strong similarities. People asked for the similarities between Sikkim and Arunachal. There's definitely uh, there's definitely been interaction there. I, I think we, we share some of the same important religious figures uh, that are sort of cross Himalayan. Um, and uh, you also see uh, respect for the same kinds of teachers. Um, for example, there, there are Bhutanese who uh, they consider their root guru to be in Sikkim, and so if they're naming a child or if there's a funeral, they might they might uh, actually uh, go to Sikkim. I, I think it's more difficult now with COVID; uh, the borders are a little bit more tight. But in the past, when when travel was allowed, uh, there was much more of that. I hope that that answers your question in part. Okay, thank you. Okay. So no, no major conflicts yeah, between all diverse groups? No, not really. No, no. I mean, I think misunderstandings are common <laughs> with all human groups. But, yeah. but in general, it's, I mean, we've, we've always been really lucky to be a very peaceful country. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, Sutishmita. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dolma, for your uh, excellent lecture. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, since uh, in the uh, in welcome address and also when, while you, you are being introduced, uh, you have learned anthropology from outside your country, uh, as mm -hmm. far I can get it. So I would like to know how your learnings uh, will help uh, anthropology to grow in Bhutan. How? What are what are the future plannings you have from your end? Uh, to develop anthropology in Bhutan. Oh my gosh, um, I, I I don't I don't I'm I'm not very powerful, so I mean like I can I can do what I can in my classroom, but I think I think there there are important decisions being made at a national level, um, particularly uh, the Department of Culture is. They've, they've been talking about having um, sort of uh, some workshops and seminars to sit down and think about how to integrate, for example, the teaching of cultural heritage. So I think I think in the end, uh, those decisions will be made at a much higher level than, than me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think, is there any question? Uh, any, yeah, we have time if there are any questions. From the participants? If not, then uh, I will proceed. Any questions? Okay. Now, uh, from from behalf of the organizing committee, I again uh, thank you for your excellent presentation, Dr. Roda. And uh, you know that uh, during the 2015, I had uh, a, a contact with uh, Dr. Penzo, right? After after going after gone through this article of anthropology of Bhutan, I wrote a mail and after a few days he replied, and uh, he also said that uh, yes we are in a way of building the anthropology. We have the good uh, outlook of the anthropology, but uh, very very early stage. Now now the thing is that uh, in his article. One thing uh, very, very stuck in my mind that uh, there is a, a policy uh, for the national policy of Bhutan to, to not to do the permission to do work of the foreigners into the Bhutan uh, research or in, anything else. Uh, is there any change of the policy of the national level? Uh, I think in general, I mean, I think this is, uh, it's not just scholars. I think we just, we just have pretty strict immigration policies in general. Um, the, so that's still there. I think it's still possible to come as a scholar, um, but usually not independently. 
usually there needs to be there needs to be some connection to uh, a university here um, so that's still there I, I don't think the immigration policy is is going to change anytime soon I, I feel like for a lot of countries uh, especially small countries people are careful <laughs> um, and so uh, that that hasn't what, really changed. What about the habilities? Uh, Helvetas uh, project. The Helvetas project. Yeah. Who are yeah. you, who are you working in that particular project to collect the ethnographic data? Is there any Bhutanese or the outside the Bhutan? It was all Bhutanese. It was all local local scholars. They worked um, with uh, different academic institutions, and the leader, uh, sort of the team leader, he was someone who is a visual anthropologist who had his MA from. Uh, Oxford. Now he now he's working. Um, he's working for uh, a different project. He's no longer a scholar, but uh, so it was. It was led by a team of Bhutanese, more or less. I think the only person they brought in from the outside is they wanted to do um, some photo voice exercises with the communities, where they were teaching the communities to document their own culture. And for that, they had uh, a Swiss uh, art teacher come in. Uh, to teach that, but the rest of uh, the rest of it was only using uh, local scholars. Yeah. That, yeah. That. Now, the, now you have used that term scholarship. No, several times you have used in your uh, lecture and also uh, in the in the writing of uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tenzo. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a word you have used scholarship. Scholarship. Mm -hmm. What do you mean that, that about the scholarship? So I, by scholarship, I just mean academic work. Um, but of course, uh, I, I, it, I wanted. I think for in for in Bhutan, we want to make sure it's inclusive of the the work that was going on at monasteries. For us, that's a really important work, and that's important work. That's important to our history. And I don't think that is quite academic. I don't think the word academic quite captures that. So I think we're using the word scholarship in order to be more inclusive about knowledge uh, production at, at, at these uh, religious institutes as much as we're talking about modern day academic institutions too. And uh, what about the future uh, planning to open uh, the anthropology in universities as well? In but Royal, to open anthropology. In, in Royal Temple College, you have the anthropology department, but yes. in Royal, Royal uh, University of Bhutan, uh, is there any department? I think don't, uh, have they would. They would. This is what I mentioned. They would like to have a PhD in anthropology at the College of Language and Cultural Studies, which is a government institution. At the moment, they're, they're, they have BA programs in Himalayan studies, uh, Bhutan studies. Uh, language and literature, so not quite anthropology, but definitely covering a lot of the same area as as anthropologists do. And of course, um, they 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 have strong support from people like Francoise, uh, who are who have been teaching there and helping them with program development for a long time. So there is there is plans at a government college. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. My last yeah. question is: You have the, uh, I have gone through the syllabus of. Uh, of your college, the Royal Temple College, which have, uh, which have uh, already displayed in the website, right? So you have incorporated in your uh, college uh, syllabus the physical anthropology in the name of biological anthropology. So what about the scope of uh, implementing the four field approach of anthropology uh, in Bhutan? Implementing the four field approaches, right? So like uh, physical anthropology. Uh, social culture anthropology, prehistoric mm -hmm. archaeology, and linguistic anthropology all together to, to give the holistic view of the uh, student of anthropology to understand yeah. the things. Yeah, I, I, I think we, we tend to
Uh, I think, Dr. Rod, I, I think there, there, there is some I mean, connectivity problem is going on. We are not uh, able to listen your whole uh, discussion. So, anyway, anyway uh, in future, in future, we will also communicate uh, in the particular thing. So, yes, yes, we can't hear your voice clearly. Uh, as well, can you hear me, Dr. Roder? Yes, I think I think that problem is going on. So we are in the yes, okay, okay, okay. Uh, we are in the end stage of our discussion. And if you have any uh, anyone have any kind of yes. uh, question, they can ask. Otherwise, yes. uh, Dr. Taraka, you can proceed because. Uh, Dr. Dodar have have this uh, another okay, uh, assignment. Thank you very years. much. If uh, there are no any questions or concerns regarding the lecture uh, conducted, uh, I would like to invite Ms. Gobi Gobi Reba, Department of Anthropology, DNGC, to deliver the word of thanks. Over okay. to you, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. And it's a very good to you to all. Uh, I'm here to present the word of thanks for today's lecture on behalf of uh, the Partners of Anthropology in India and Sri Lanka. I would like to thank our guest, Dr. Uh, Dharma Chodhan uh, Rodar. Uh, we are very excited with your knowledge and presence, ma'am. Uh, today's lecture was very informative, and thank you, ma'am, for enlightening us with anthropology in Bhutan. And once again, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Dorma Roger Ma'am for taking time out from our busy schedule and uh, enlightening us with our knowledge. Thank you so much, Ma'am. Now, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the immense support and their coordination. And our husband thanks to all the participants for their active participation. With these few words, uh, we move to the end of today's lecture. And thank you all for making this event uh, successful.